Welcome back to Liberty Bites on the Think Liberty Network. I'm your host, William Gadsden. You can follow me personally on Twitter at William underscore Gadsden or on Facebook by the same name. Follow Think Liberty on Facebook, Twitter, or whatever your favorite social media outlet is. Give us a follow and a like for updates on new episodes and more. But let's get to business. I have to apologize for missing a few weeks and right in the middle of the American Tyrant series to boot. I've been called away to work for a while, but I'm going to do my best to keep these episodes rolling to you. But I digress. We finished the last episode of the American Tyrant series talking about Theodore Roosevelt and how his use of the bully pulpit forever changed the dynamic between the office of the president and the people. But today, today we're going to talk about my favorite president to hate, the boss, the squire of Hyde Park, King Franklin, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, hailed as one of America's greatest presidents, the savior of the American people during the Great Depression and World War II, but was in fact one of the greatest enemies of American liberty in our short history. The power of the American president saw far more expansion under FDR than any other president, and rather than only seeking temporary expansionary measures like under Lincoln, FDR set precedents of expansionist power that last to this very day. This, of course, isn't helped by the general celebration of success that surrounds his presidency. Born in Hyde Park in New York City in 1882, as the only child to a very wealthy family, Franklin was born a sickly child. Contracting polio as a young man in 1921, he was sentenced to a life in a wheelchair, something that would haunt his political career in the near future. After attending law school at Columbia University, he served as a clerk for a law firm in the NYC. But he was quick to begin his political career. In 1910, he was elected as a state senator in New York. But his service as a state senator would only last two years. As a reward for his unwavering support of Woodrow Wilson, Franklin was appointed as the Assistant Secretary of the Navy in 1912. After a series of unsuccessful bids for election into other offices, and about with a grave illness, Franklin was elected and took office as governor of New York in 1929. Having finally gained a position in which he could exert direct authority, Franklin wasted no time in implementing big government policies. He didn't make his philosophy a secret either, insisting that, quote, progressive government by its very terms must be a living and growing thing, that the battle for it is never-ending, and that if we let up for one single moment or one single year, not merely do we stand still, but we fall back in the march of civilization. And he certainly had no qualms with forcing his philosophy through the barrel of a gun, as we will soon see. Winning the general election for President of the United States in 1932 and ascending to the office in 1933, the country was quickly sliding into the throes of the Great Depression, A quarter of the country was unemployed, homelessness was becoming rampant, and major agricultural and industrial markets were failing. Something had to be done. Who else but the government could step in and save the day? Franklin quickly implemented the first and second New Deals, creating millions of jobs and propping up otherwise failing markets. Problem solved! But at what cost? Many modern-day economists and historians agree that instead of helping, The massive government spending programs that were implemented under the hand of FDR greatly extended and exacerbated the Great Depression. Many modern-day economists and historians agree that instead of helping, the massive government spending programs that were implemented under the hand of FDR actually greatly extended and exacerbated the Great Depression, rather than pulling America out of it. The core of that, of course, is rooted in Keynesian economic policy, in the use of government spending and regulation on private sector businesses. Increased government spending in order to use contractionary fiscal policy, ideally stimulating the economy out of inflation. But of course, increased government spending necessitates an increase in taxes as well. Not to mention the massive taxpayer costs brought on by the unprecedented creation of multiple gargantuan government social programs. As most of you know, You cannot legislate wealth or success, even in the midst of the Great Depression. 
This is without even looking at the authoritarianism used in attempting to pay for those quickly rising costs, which came in the form of Executive Order 6102, which ordered all American citizens to sell their privately owned gold to the U.S. Treasury at a cost set by the federal government. The only thing that these programs really accomplished, especially in the long term, was to create more dependence on the government from the citizenry, especially when analyzing things like the Social Security Administration, the Securities and Exchange Commission, the Federal Communications Commission, and the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation, along with a myriad of other costly government-run social welfare programs, all brought about under FDR's administration. All in all, the Great Depression was the perfect storm of an excuse to consolidate more power under the federal government than had ever been done before or since. Even the policies and regulation that he was able to pass wasn't enough for Franklin. There had to be more, but much of the policies that he wanted were found to be unconstitutional and were struck down. Naturally, Roosevelt sought to remedy this in any way that he could. So he looked to what is known as court packing. Many of you may not know this, but the number of the Supreme Court justices has changed at least three times throughout America's history. Every time it has, it was done with the intent of expanding the number of Supreme Court justices in order for the sitting president to install justices that agreed with his policies and would see that they sailed cleanly past the Supreme Court, even if the policies in question were constitutionally questionable at best. Franklin used this as his trump card to push through the less-than-sound policies of his New Deal, attempting to expand the number of Supreme Court justices and flip the decisions made by the sitting Supreme Court that struck down many of his New Deal policies with the Judicial Procedures Reform Bill of 1937. Ultimately, this plot failed, but it is a good measure for the lengths at which FDR was willing to go in order to see that his agenda was pursued, whether the people wanted it or not. But all of that pales in comparison to what might have been. During Franklin's State of the Union address to Congress in 1944, he proposed the so-called Second Bill of Rights, in which every citizen would be entitled to a list of material goods and services that would ensure a, quote, fair standard of living across the U.S. to include, quote, the right to a decent home, adequate medical care, and a good education, among other things, all backed and enforced by the federal government, of course. He saw this massive expansion of federal obligation and spending thusly, quote, This republic had its beginnings and grew to its present strength under the protection of certain inalienable political rights, among them the right to free speech, free press, free worship, trial by jury, freedom from unreasonable searches and seizures. They were our rights to life and liberty. As our nation has grown in size and stature, however, as our industrial economy expanded, these political rights proved inadequate to assure us equality in the pursuit of happiness. Now, the political genius of this cannot be overstated. Not only is he promising the citizenry free things, insured by the federal government, but he is purposefully conflating the idea of positive and negative rights, treating them as equals instead of as opposites. For those of you who haven't seen the previous episode on positive and negative rights, the main thing to remember here is that negative rights are things that are guaranteed to you by way of keeping the government out of your business. The Bill of Rights is all negative rights, but positive rights are things that are given to you by the government, usually in the form of material goods or services. Of course, all pos positive rights come at the cost of someone else, and it's usually you or your neighbor, the taxpayer. For Franklin to equate the two was to gloss over the massive differences between the two forms of rights and in turn usher in an entirely new wave of government control over the life of the individual, to the sound of applause. Thankfully, we don't live in a world that that has happened. Yet. Perhaps his greatest breach of the rights of the individual, though, didn't come in the form of economic regulation, but civil regulation. This came in the form of Executive Order 9066, which essentially removed what little civil rights the Japanese Americans had at the time. 
over 122,000 Japanese Americans were rounded up and placed in internment camps for the duration of World War II. Without a trial, without a hearing, without an opportunity to redress grievances with their own government. More than half of them were American citizens. All of this being done despite not one, but two reports from the American military and law enforcement intelligence apparatus claiming that there was no threat presented by those that were to be interred. Both of these reports were flat out ignored by the Roosevelt administration in the name of national security. While being held against their will by their own government, due only to their ethnicity, many of them lost their homes, businesses, and private property, being allowed to only bring a suitcase of their personal belongings as they entered the camps, and leaving the rest behind to be absconded with or claimed by their fellow American citizens. All in all, the four-term-long presidency of FDR was one that saw the greatest expansion of federal government power in American history, barreling through all that stood against it, including the Constitution itself. FDR had no qualms with expanding the power of the presidency within the boundaries of the Constitution, albeit through extremely loose interpretation. But when even that wouldn't meet its ends, he had no issue with brushing it aside and handling it himself through executive order. Many of the policies and government organizations that he put into place continue to hamper our constitutional republic to this day, especially the Social Security Administration, the SEC, and the FCC, using unaccountable bureaucrats and unelected officials to force money directly from the citizenry in the name of their personal fiscal security, regulating trade between private industries and companies, and what information the American people are and aren't allowed to hear across the constantly growing spectrums of media outlets. That's my last episode for the American Tyrant series before we do our closing episode. I hope you'll check in next week for that. And as always, to become more liberty-centered with us. I'm William Gadsden with Think Liberty.